Welcome to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. This podcast is brought to you by SavingYouTaxes.com and hosted by J. Barry Watts. As an advanced tax strategist and enrolled agent federally licensed by the IRS, Barry is uniquely qualified to go deeper into the Internal Revenue Code than most accountants. He understands and interprets its provisions explaining how they'll help you reduce income taxes you owe so you can direct that previously wasted tax money into tax-free accounts that you can enjoy in your retirement years. Now, on today's episode... Hello, and welcome to another edition of The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. I'm Barry Watts, IRS-trained tax strategist and your host. And today we're going to talk about two checks you need in retirement. Our guest today is an expert on this topic. Retired once, but working harder than ever to help people like you retire and stay retired. He is a retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel, so you might want to sit up a little straighter in your seat as you listen, and be sure you punctuate your questions with sir. He commanded the 301st Military Intelligence Battalion. By the way, I checked to see that's about a thousand soldiers, and they supported counterterrorism operations through Desert Storm and Desert Shield and the War on Terror, which began, of course, with the attack on the Twin Towers. When he finally retired from protecting our country, he just changed battlefields and went from defending the homeland to defending retirees by becoming a credentialed expert on retirement income. Along the way, he helped clients protect over $5 billion from stock market risk and turned it into monthly mailbox money. He's the author of several books, the most interesting of which are, I think, Paychecks and Playchecks and Don't Worry, Retire Happy, which then became a PBS television special in North America. We welcome today to the broadcast, Tom Hegna. Colonel Hegna, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks, Barry. Great to be with you. Coming to you live from uh, Arizona today. Well, I hope it's a little warmer in Arizona. Springtime was here and then it went away in the Missouri Ozarks. Yeah, I think uh, it's going to hit over 80 today. And now we're in the 40s. So uh, we, we were there, but it got away from us. It's kind of like the stock market. We were there. We were all done with this. And then it went a new direction, you know, but that's another topic. Colonel Hagna, thank you very much for your service to our country. We appreciate that. You bet. So t- tell us what's interesting about you and the work you do. Where do you begin when you start telling someone in your elevator speech about who Tom Hagna is and what he does? Well, I got a little, I mean, I'm originally from a small town in Minnesota. I went to college at North Dakota State University on an Army ROTC scholarship, was commissioned in the military, spent six years active duty, 16 and a half years uh, Army Reserve. As you said, I retired as Lieutenant Colonel. I was in the insurance industry for almost 30 years. I was eight years with MetLife. I was 15 years with New York Life in 2011. I retired from all that. And then I went out on my own and written the books and have the PBS TV special. And right now, I would say I am 75% retired. So I'm not just talking the talk. I'm walking the walk. I'm doing all the things that I've written about, spoke about, and where all the research, because the research does show there is an optimal way to to retire. And and most people don't know that. So I just share that with them. So um, your paychecks then are a little more play checks these days because you're getting to spend more time playing. And in Arizona, I guess that means you golf, uh, what, like nine days a week? Uh, four to five days a week. And, uh, you know, for for three uh, for for 30 years, I spent 200 nights a year on the road and I just couldn't make a country club work, you know, with a with a monthly and the buy in and the food and beverage. Now I'm a member of two clubs and the numbers work just great because uh, we spend our win- winters down here and then we spend our summers up in Flagstaff. And, um, you know, in 2020, I won the club championship up there and I'm the current senior club champion. And so I- I'm, I'm like having fun. It's like I'm at summer camp every day is the way it feels. So your game's doing OK and you're yeah. liking being retired. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking it. Yes, so, I am. So tell me this. How did you pivot? How did you make the transition from military man to guy who deals with retirement planning? How did that happen? Oh, that's a funny story. So I was a commander out at Fort Ord, California in the 7th Infantry Division Light. And there was a MetLife agent going through my unit selling whole life insurance. And at the time, I was a buy, term, and invest the difference guy. And I said, who's this guy ripping off my soldiers? I said, bring him to me. Because when you're a commander, you can do that. And they said, well, sir, he, he can come by tomorrow, but he wanted your birth date. I said, give him my birth date. I want to see him in my office. And I, he comes in. I said, what are you doing ripping off my soldiers selling this rip off life insurance? He says, oh, no, sir, I'm protecting those families. 
families. I'm helping them save up for their kids' college education, for a down payment on their house, and I can give them tax-free income in retirement. Your, your soldiers are good enough to to uh, give me your birth date, so I ran an illustration for you. And this was before the seven-pay <laughs> test. This was a five-pay whole life policy. And I said, let me see this piece of crap. I said, okay, pay for five years. And then I got my cash value there in the sixth year. My cash value goes up. My death benefit goes up. I'm paying nothing for the rest of my life. I said, who would buy term insurance if you could buy this? He said, I don't sell much term insurance. That's what I sell. I said, you get paid to sell this stuff? He said, I get paid good to sell this stuff. I said, I could sell that stuff. And that's how I got in the insurance industry. That is a true story. Well, that is a very good story. Now, you're not just, though, a life insurance guy. You deal in a lot of other kinds of products, but predominantly in the insurance industry, correct? Yeah, but I don't sell any products. I just show people how to use how, how the... All the research has been done by PhDs all over the world. Dr. David Babel, Dr. Moshe Malevsky, Dr. Michael Finke, Dr. Wade Fow, Nobel Prize winners, uh, William, Dr. William Sharp, Dr. Robert C. Merton. So retirement has been studied in depth and there is the right way to do it. And that's all I talk about. So I don't have a horse in the game. I don't sell any products. But even Ernst & Young just came out with a white paper like a few weeks ago and they tried to find the best investment. What is the optimal way to invest? And you know what they found? They tried 100% stock. 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30, 60, 40, 50, 50. And then they went back and they added a cash value life insurance policy and an income annuity. And you know what they found? The optimal portfolio has investments, annuities, and life insurance. Now, you and I know that. We've known that for 30 years, but it's kind of neat that all of the so-called <laughs> experts are figuring out finally. Well, you get validated on it. And and just on that topic, Tom, I had a client I was working with uh, in the past three months who um, it was right before Christmas. And the final day, uh, I'm like, okay, this is the plan. This is what we ought to do. And they said, okay, it's all good. But they said, we don't want to execute today. Instead, we're going to go for Christmas. Uh, I got to talk to her dad because he's where we get all of our advice. And and so they came back then in, in January, canceled their appointment and said, dad said, if you mentioned anything about life insurance, we should never talk with you. And so we don't want to talk with you anymore. And it was really a huge loss to them. And frustrating, of course, to me, because we'd worked so hard to build for them a plan that would support them all the way to age 100. And so the level of ignorance that exists in the world of insurance or, or in the world of investors related to insurance is really strong. Why do you think um, the public sometimes feels so negatively toward insurance? And, and by the way, this podcast is not about insurance at all. Yeah. It's just where the conversation started. So go ahead and tell me, why yeah. do you think people feel that way? Well, I think there's a lot of mis misunderstanding. Yeah. And then you got these experts on TV or on YouTube saying, oh, only buy term or whatever. You know, term, ins I'm not against term insurance, but you can't use term to leave a legacy to your kids. Like if you're 75, your term mm -hmm. policy is long gone because it got too expensive. You can't use term for estate planning. You can't use term for most business planning. I'm not against term. It's there for younger people who are really hard up on dollars. It gives them adequate protection for a low price for a short period of time. But over time, term is your most expensive policy by far. I have a 12 pay policy that's done in 12 years. Those, I believe, are the best types of policies to give because you're done paying, but you got coverage for the rest of your life. So it's really which policy is best for that person's situation. And I can promise you it's not always going to be term. If term is the only policy, less than less than 2% of term policies ever pay a death claim. So if term's the only policy you got, you're going to have zero life insurance over 98% of the time. So it's good for what it does. It's like, I'm, it's like renting a house. I'm not against renting a house, but do you really want to rent a house your entire life? You know, I don't think so. When I'm in college, I do. If I'm between jobs, if I need a short term, I'll rent. But otherwise, I'm going to own. And, you know, it's the same with life insurance. So true confessions here. When I I was a young man in my 20s. Uh, somehow I got connected up with uh, a guy from Northwestern Mutual. He came to see me. And of course, I didn't have any money. That's classic when you're in your 20s. It sometimes extends into your 50s and 60s. Uh, fortunately, I'm not in that category. But I didn't have any money. And so I told him I wanted term insurance. And uh, he tried to show me whole life or permanent life insurance. And I told him, nope, thank you. I don't want anything to do with that because all you insurance guys are just interested in that because it's loaded with commissions. I don't want to have the conversation. And I only bought term insurance. Did you know I was 50 years old before I bought 
permanent insurance and pun- funded a 15 pay LERP design to get me tax free income in retirement. And I'm thrilled with it. And by the way, just yesterday, I had a client in my office doing a portfolio review and we looked at every investment they had and they had annuities and they had stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and they had a LERP design. And you know what the best performance of any of them had been over the past year? Uh, the the design life yep. insurance. Yep. <laughs> so it really is interesting. It's a shame we let our uh, our supposed smarts, which is really ignorance, uh, get in our way. So you wrote a, a number of books, but two of the popular ones, are, or we'll start with one of them, is Paychecks and Playchecks. Where did that term come from? Well, what happened was I, I was speaking at the Million Dollar Roundtable, and I was talking about the importance of guaranteed lifetime income. And they said, well, we got to have a title for this talk. Like we got to have a title for it. And so I, throughout the talk, I talk about the importance of having a paycheck, but then I talk about how important it is to also have some play checks. And, and one of the people, one of the, videographers or one of the guys, he's like a technical person. He goes, I think you should call paychecks and playchecks. So that's what we did. And so that was the title of my talk. And then we took that talk and we put it into a book. And so that's where paychecks and playchecks came from. You know, that book and your other book, don't, uh, don't worry, retire happy. Yep. Uh, that both of those were out on the, uh, the coffee table uh, where people sit and wait to see me and they've both disappeared. Uh, so <laughs> it's interesting uh, how, how people preparing re- for retirement. I don't know if they're thieves or what, but my books disappeared. And that's all right, because obviously we want to get that message out there and are delighted to share that information. So when you were working with retirees back when you were in practice before you were speaking so much, tell me, what are the the the, res- the mistakes that you see retirees make that you're trying to address? I I think too many people think retirement's about assets, about having a pile of money versus what's really important. And the two really important things are, number one, you want to have increasing income for the rest of your life and as much tax-free increasing income as possible. And then it's about risk management. What happens if we have rampant inflation? What happens if interest rates you know, go down to zero or go up to 10%? What happens if the stock market crashes? What happens if you need long-term care? The, there's all kinds of risks in retirement. And so retirement is really about having increasing income and managing risk. It's not about how many millions of dollars you got in your 401k, you know, and I'm not a big fan of 401ks either, because I think, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and he goes, I got a million dollars in my 401k. I said, great. I said, how much of that is yours? He said, what do you mean? It's all mine. I said, no, 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 no. You have a partner. In fact, you're the limited partner. The government's the general partner and the general partner gets to take theirs first and you get what's ever left over. And the problem is you have no idea how much they're going to take. Right now they're taking 37, 38%. What happens when that goes back to 50 and 60%, which I think if you look at the budget and the deficit, the debt, $31 trillion, taxes are going to have to go up so much. People are going to be just be caught blindsided. And I just think, as much increasing tax-free income and risk management, that's way more important than how many millions of dollars you're trying to save. How did that guy respond when you said that to him? He was shocked. Like he, well, I never thought about it that way. Well, <laughs> that's what I get paid to do is to think about it that way. And I, you know, so I've converted, I think, almost all of my IRAs and 401ks to Roth. Most of those are in income annuities. I own 11 annuities. I don't sell annuities. I just buy them. I own them. <laughs> and so I'm going to have increasing tax-free income for the rest of my life. I've been putting my, my I did a 12-pay life policy. I started mine at 50 as well. Uh, 226000 a year is my premium. And so people who like are t- have the term insurance mine, they say 226000 that's ridiculous because they're thinking life insurance is an expense. But as you and I know, it's not an expense. It's an asset. It's an asset on my balance sheet. All that money is there plus a lot more. So, and and, and I can turn on the switch and have somewhere between 10 and 15,000 tax free to me every month for the rest of my life. Plus, it's creditor protected. And I think that's something that. A lot of people don't think about, but in the, I think about it because, you know, I get in front of hundreds of thousands of people. There's lawsuits everywhere. Nobody can steal my money because in, in the state of Arizona, all the money that's in life insurance and annuities is creditor protected. They can't sue it from me. So, you know, I, what I try to do, number one, I try to build my wealth. Number two, I try to protect my wealth. And number three, I try to distribute it as efficiently as possible. Those are the three key steps in, in wealth. 
So you mentioned inflation, and, and it's interesting. Just this morning, the news came out that the inflation rate currently is six percent. Um, when you speak to somebody about the rising cost of living, what mechanism do you recommend they use to address that particular problem? Well, you know, there's several ways to do it. Uh, okay, I've done it this way. I own eleven annuities. Some of them kick in at age sixty. Some of them kick in at age sixty-two. Some at sixty-five. Some at seventy. Some will kick in wherever I want. If I don't want, I don't kick them in. And so I, I do it that way. The other way you can do it is have at least enough guaranteed income to cover your basic living expenses, your food, your housing, your clothing, your cell phone and everything. That's the paycheck. And then invest into stocks and real estate and commodities, things that typically go up in times of inflation. That's another way to do it. There are also some products out there, some annuity products that every year will give you a three or four or five percent increase. So I really don't care how people do it. I just want to make sure they have increasing income. Now, you started your career on the insurance side of our industry, not the security side, correct? That's correct. But I was I, I was a registered rep as well, so I've dealt on both sides of it. I did, did, so so let me ask you, this is a personal question. We're, we're, this is my own confessional time here. Uh, starting on the security side, you start with kind of an edge that is a little bit anti-insurance. And very few people are able to cross over that and embrace insurance fully for the things that it will do, which I can do. But I certainly understand the mentality that that is a little bit of, I call it anti insurance. How did you get beyond that? Or maybe you never had that problem since you started on the insurance side of the industry. No, you know, I was pretty open minded as an advisor. I wasn't one of these advisors who just sold annuities or just sold life insurance or just sold mutual funds or just sold managed money. I I, I figured it's like a toolbox and, and I had all these tools available and whatever that client wanted, I had the tools that I could help them with. I, I do like investing. I, I do some investments, but what I don't like about investing is losing money. And anybody who's invested for any amount of period of time has lost money. And if they haven't, they're lying because I know I, and I, I think I'm a pretty good investor and I can still lose money. So that's what I don't like. And I learned after losing money a few times that there's something to have money in places where it never goes down. And well, there's a lot of good things about having money where it can never go down. It just goes up, never goes down. And so I've learned to have a nice mix of the two. I don't think, you know, you should have all your money in one or all your money in the other. I think it's it's a mix. But I think the older you get, the more the mix should go towards protection versus just out there. Like I would not want to be naked in the stock market today with all the things going on with interest rates and banks failing and everything. If I was 70 years old, I'm not, but if I was, I would not want to be naked in the stock market. I would want to have some guarantees. If I'm going to be in the market, I would want to have some guarantees. So I do have some variable annuities as well, where I can take some risk, but still be guaranteed not to lose my money. Right. And, and so I, I just, I'm one of those people that leans towards the, the safer side. And I think if you talk to really wealthy people, you know, they don't have all their money sitting in the stock market. Okay. They got a lot of money sitting in guaranteed places. So I, I just think the average person out there thinks wealthy people are invested hundred percent in the stock market. And that is not true. Oh no, that's not true. So you, you opened a can of worms here. Let's go ahead and uh, pour it out on the table and uh, take a few bites of it. Uh, last week we heard about the collapse of the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley bank. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is, uh, everybody can have a chance to be jazzed up about that and be afraid about their own bank and stop and pause and consider. But more than that, people who are invested in insurance companies could then begin to wonder, well, is my insurance company safe? Talk to us about that problem they faced and about the difference between depositing money in insurance company accounts and bank accounts and the security behind them and so forth. Yeah. So the, the one thing most people think is that U.S. government bonds are completely safe. And uh, while if you hold a bond to maturity, that's true in between, it's not true. So like, let's say you have a 10 year bond, you buy a 10 year bond that's paying one percent. If that interest rate goes up to five percent, your one percent bond has gone down in value 80 percent because nobody's going to pay you a thousand dollars for a one percent bond when they could pay a thousand dollars for a five percent bond so they'll pay you two hundred dollars for that bond right so so what happens with banks and insurance companies because they're safe they buy safe things like bonds okay the the problem that happened with with silicon valley bank is that they didn't match the duration of the bonds to their obligations. So they had a lot of long duration bonds. They had 10 and 20 and 30 year bonds on the books. Well, people show up today and say, I want my money. Well, they could pay you your money over the 10 and 20 years because you don't lose any money in a government bond if you hold it to maturity. But if you sell it early, 
they could be down 70, 80 percent. And so what happened was Silicon Valley Bank would have been fine if they wouldn't have done a run on the bank. But when everybody shows up the door saying, I want my money, I want my money, I want my money. They didn't have the liquidity to be able to do that. That's what George Bailey said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's very similar to what happened to George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. And so so the deal is the difference between a bank and an insurance company is, number one, the banks have a lot more leverage. They can they can take your dollar and they can lend it out to 10 different people. They can go 10 to one on leverage. Insurance companies don't do that. They're, they're not levered. The other thing is insurance companies, when they buy bonds, they buy it to match the obligation. So if they sell an annuity, let's say the average annuity has a seven year time frame on it. You know, it could be a little more, it could be a little, but they're going to use a 10 year bond to do that. And they're going to match that liability with 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 a with a sale of of an annuity okay and, and they'll purchase a bond to back that up the problem with the banks are is that they issue CDs and and shorter term things so so they should have had more one and two year bonds they they had no business owning so many 10 and 20 and 30 year bonds that it was way too much risk for for what they needed whereas the insurance company is better at matching the obligation i can promise you insurance companies right now have billions of dollars of so-called losses on their books if you if you mark to market if you if you say what's the value of that bond today but they don't care what the value of that bond is today because they're going to hold it all the way to maturity so they're not going to lose any money and uh but what happened with Silicon Bank is they just didn't match their liabilities accurately with the right types of bonds. And then a rumor got out that they're in trouble. Everybody showed up. Give me my money. Well, they didn't have it. So Well, and reserves at a bank, don't they, they're required to keep like, I don't know, less than a nickel on every dollar deposited in reserves, whereas an insurance company keeps a dollar in reserves for yeah. every dollar deposited. Yeah, so, so insurance companies and banks are very different in that in that manner. But but I will tell you, could it be possible for some insurance company to be sideways on their bonds? It it, it, it could happen. I hope it doesn't. But, you know, that, that when, when the Federal Reserve raises rates so fast, somebody can get caught off guard by holding the wrong the wrong bonds. But that's why in Paychecks and Playchecks, I say not all insurance companies are created equal and that you've got to look at their financial strength and ratings do matter. Ratings matter maybe more than so. So like if you've got a triple A company that's offering this and then you got a single A company that's offering just a little bit more. I might stick with the AAA, even though it pays a little less just because of the safety of the portfolio. But, you know, I leave that up to the advisors on what they recommend uh, to their clients. All right. We're going to take a break and hear a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll hear more from Tom Hegna about paychecks, playchecks, and how to retire happy. You're listening to the truth about taxes and retirement. This episode of The Truth About Taxes and Retirement is brought to you by the WealthCare Corporation, a national personal wealth management firm with taxes at its center, because they realize that no matter how well you do with savings and investments, if you don't plan correctly, those paychecks and playchecks may come with taxes, and they want to help you reduce those taxes as much as possible, maybe even eliminate them altogether. Let's face it, retiring is complicated. And you want to be sure you do it right the first time. The team of CPAs, tax strategists, and retirement income planners at the WealthCare Corporation has helped thousands of people retire over the past 30 years. They can help you, too, to figure out when you should take Social Security, how to structure your investments so you don't lose them in a down market, and how to take your income in such a way that it lasts as long as possible, maybe even to age 100. And a little icing on top of the cake? They routinely help people reduce their lifetime income tax payments by more than 50%. Reach out to the folks at the WealthCare Corporation and ask them to help you retire with more income, more confidence, and in a way that leaves a legacy for your family. It won't cost anything to have a 15-minute phone conversation. You can find their number by visiting www.savingyoutaxes.com. We're back on the truth about taxes and retirement with our special guest, Tom Hegna, author of the book Paychecks and Playchecks. Tom, tell us more about your book and what the theme of the book really is. Kind of give us the whole 250 pages in two paragraphs, if you can. 
Yeah. So what I love about Paychecks and Playchecks is, is it concludes with four simple steps. So these are four simple steps any of your listeners can put into action that will help their retirement. Step number one, you want to cover your basic living expenses in retirement with guaranteed lifetime income. So really step one, you got to figure out how much money do you need every month for your housing, your clothing, your food, your cell phone, your internet, your green fees, whatever your normal retirement expenses are, that should be covered with guaranteed lifetime income. Now, there are three sources of guaranteed lifetime income. The first First source is social security. Well, what is social security? It's a lifetime income <laughs> annuity. It's a guaranteed paycheck for life. So it counts. The second source is a pension. Well, what is a pension? A pension is a lifetime income annuity. It's a guaranteed paycheck for life. So it counts. So you take what are your total basic living expenses, subtract out your social security, subtract out your pension, whatever that gap is, that's where the annuity fits. You go find an insurance company, buy an income annuity to cover those basic living expenses. So that's step number one. Step number two, you want to optimize the rest of the portfolio to protect yourself against inflation. Because I said you want to have increasing income. So that's where the stocks can fit. That's where investments can fit. Those types of things. Step number three, you must have a plan for long-term care. See, long-term care is the one thing most people leave out that can wipe out their entire life's work. Both my parents were in assisted living, $10,000 a month. I know how expensive it is, okay? So you got to have a plan for long-term care. And then step number four, the most efficient way to pass wealth to children, grandchildren, and charities is with life insurance. One of the reasons many people don't enjoy their retirement is they think they got to leave their kids some money. Oh, we got to leave some money to Johnny and Susie. We got to leave some money to Johnny and Susie. So they deny themselves a retirement to leave money to their kids. I tell people all the time, don't do that. You're not supposed to leave any money to your kids. You're supposed to spend your money. Leave them life insurance because you can do that for pennies on the dollar. And I use me as an example because we got four kids. And one day we're sitting around saying, hmm, how much do we leave the kids? My wife said, I don't know. What do you think? I said, well, if we bought a $1 million second die life insurance policy, name the four kids a beneficiary. When we're both gone, they're going to get a million dollars tax-free. I mean, that's $250,000 a piece tax-free, plus there'll be stuff left over. I said, let's start there. So we bought that $1 million policy, second to die, name the four kids a beneficiary. That policy is completely paid up. Total cost of policy? 150,000. So now think about that. For 15 cents on the dollar, we get to transfer a million dollars tax-free to our kids. But here's the best part. Who gets to spend the other 850,000? We do. Don't leave your kids money. Spend your money. Leave them life insurance. You can do that for pennies on the dollar. So I hear you talk about maximizing gain and minimizing loss. How do we do that? Well, I mean, you've got, you know, you've got the tools to do that. So I like to put my money in places where my money can go up, but won't go down. Now, I could do that if I'm very conservative. I could do that with some type of fixed product, a fixed annuity or a whole life policy. We'll do that. If I'm a little more aggressive, I could go with a fixed indexed annuity that could give me a potentially a, a higher return, but guarantees I won't lose or an index universal life policy that maybe can give me a higher return, but will guarantee that I, I won't lose in mar years that the market goes down. Or I could get more aggressive and, and go with a variable annuity where I have unlimited upside. And there are some companies that it will even put a guarantee that you won't lose your cash over a 10 year period of time. So if I put in 100,000, I'm guaranteed not to have less than 100,000 in 10 years. If it goes to 200,000, I can reset that. And 10 years later, I'm guaranteed not to have 300, 200,000. If it goes to 300,000, so I can reset those gains. It, it just depends on what level of timing risk you want to take versus you know what you want guaranteed but I, I could do the other thing and just put it all naked in the stock market and if it goes up i get it if it goes down i get that i just i'm at a point where i don't want to lose money anymore okay i've i've made money i've lost money i, I just i've learned if i can take the losses out i can do pretty darn good if i can just take the losses away so the big danger that uh, over 90% of my clients face is uh, long-term care expense. You mentioned you were paying yeah. $10,000 uh, for each mom and dad. Were they in the uh, in the facility at the same time? They were in an assisted living together. It was 10,000 for the both oh, for of them. The pair see, of them. I had made I made them buy long-term care insurance 18 years ago. They didn't want to. It's too expensive. We'll never need it. It's an insurance company rip off. My dad said all those words to me. I made them buy it. They didn't buy it for me. I just made them find a financial advisor, buy one. And that thing paid off. I mean, I can't even imagine what would happen to their retirement if they didn't have those policies. 
So what kind of tools do we use today? Because you can't just go buy the long-term care policy your mom and dad bought. That They're so expensive. The premiums double or the benefits are cut in half. Seems like every year. How do we do that today in this environment? How so there's really three care? ways. Number one, you can buy a traditional uh, long-term care insurance policy. All right. And for the people who think they're expensive, I say, well, if you think that's expensive, try not having one because that's really expensive. The second option is to buy a life insurance policy that comes with a long-term care benefit or rider. I kind of like that because it does three things. Number one, it's an emergency fund. If you need the money out, most of them have full money back guarantee. You can get your money out. Number two, if you don't need long-term care, you know, it basically doubles as a tax-free death benefit to your family. But if you do need long-term care, there's a big bucket of money that's available to you. So like I used to, I used to draw it on a circle. I'd say, okay, let's say I'm working with like a 60 year old female. I'd say, okay, you got a hundred thousand dollars there, bank of America. If you rolled that over here, that will stay here. It'll earn probably more than you're getting at the bank. It grows tax deferred. But if you need the money out, you can get it out. But if you don't need it, then I draw a circle that's doubled. There's a $200,000 tax-free death benefit to your family. But if you need long-term care, there's about a $300,000 bucket that you can use for long-term care. And I just use those numbers as an example. It's going to depend on whether you're male or female, if you're in good health or bad health and all that stuff. But that's a simple way to explain it. And then the third way there are now annuities that have long-term care benefits. So even if somebody can't qualify medically, let's say they've had two heart attacks or they have diabetes or they have some problem, they can get the annuity. So I don't care how people do it. I just want them to have a plan because not having a plan is not a very good plan. It's going to be a very, very expensive plan. And if you say, oh, my wife will take care of me. I'd be out and I'd say, what about, oh, my wife will take care of me. I said, okay, sir, I need you to lay down on the floor over here. Now, ma'am, just come over here, pick him up and carry him out there, outside and, and put him in the car. Oh, I can't do that. Well, that's long-term care. <laughs> and and then when you study that the people who give the care, their life expectancy goes down. So like having your spouse do your long term care is almost like giving your spouse a, a death sentence because their life expectancy goes down significantly. And I always say, do you really want to have your daughter cleaning you and giving you a bath or would you rather have her making sure that the person doing that is on time and everything like I want my family there to manage the care, not to give me care. And I, I think that's the way most people would 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 prefer it. Well, going naked as it is on yeah. long term care, not having coverage certainly would leave a person sad and unhappy. Your book is Don't Worry, Retire Happy. So tell us what the thesis and principle is behind that book as we begin to wrap up. So, yeah. So this one it has seven steps instead of four. It also adds social security maximization. It also includes the importance of having a plan. It also includes using home equity wisely, considering a hybrid retirement. That means not just going cold turkey, kind of easing into retirement. That's what I'm doing. But the whole point of happiness is all the research that's shown the happiest people in retirement are those people who have guaranteed lifetime income. Think about it. It's the teachers. It's the doctors. It's the nurses. It's the firefighters. It's a police policemen, it's military, government, they have pensions. Happiness in retirement is tied almost 100% to guaranteed lifetime income. The Wall Street Journal had the headline, the secret to a happier retirement is friends, neighbors, and a fixed annuity. I'm not making it up. Time Magazine found it too. You know, lifetime income stream, key to retirement happiness. There's all the research. And now the research also shows people with guaranteed income tend to live longer. They have less stress. They don't worry. And because they're being paid to live, many of them choose to live differently. They watch what they eat. They exercise. They call the doctor. They're not feeling well. So I would encourage people to read the book. I know we're almost out of time, but but if you want to retire happy, you, know, you want to retire based in math and science, not based on some stockbroker's opinion. By the way, you know why they call them brokers, right? Because you're a broker than you were 12 months ago. So, <laughs> you know, you want to put some guarantees into that portfolio. That's what all the research shows. So the books are Don't Worry, Retire Happy and Paychecks and Playchecks. They're by Tom Hegna. That's H-E-G-N-A. And you can get those at Amazon or your favorite bookstore, I'm sure. Tom, we're out of time for today. It's been a great pleasure having you on the show. I want to finish with one question. You're 60 years old in just a touch, I think. Uh, you've commanded a thousand soldiers. You've helped people protect five billion dollars. What is the one life principle that you'd want to leave with our listeners today? People don't 
plan to fail. They simply fail to plan. The number one most important thing is to sit down with a financial professional like you, Barry, and start a plan. That, that'd be, I say, that's that's the most important. You can't solve all the problems in one sit down, but you can start a plan. And once you have a plan, then you have a roadmap, you have a GPS, and then you can attain what you want to attain. It's been a lot of fun being with you today. Thanks so much for being a guest here on The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. And we say to our listeners, thank you for being patrons of the show. We appreciate the fact that you listen so faithfully. On behalf of our sponsors, the Wealthcare Corporation, I'm your host, Barry Watts, reminding you that it really doesn't matter how big your paychecks and playchecks are. If you have to give most of them back in taxes, you're still not going to be happy. We want you to not worry, to be happy, and that starts with getting the taxes right. And they can help you with that at the Wealthcare Corporation. Visit them on the web to schedule a free 15-minute introductory phone conversation by going to www.savingyoutaxes.com. This has been a production of the Wealthcare Corporation, found on the web at savingyoutaxes.com. The concepts discussed are for informational and educational purposes only and should not be implemented without first consulting with your own legal, tax, and investment counsel. This has not been an offer to buy, sell, or invest in securities. And this information is to be taken as educational concepts and not as specific advice for you. The lawyers and regulators like us to remind you that all investment involves risk and you could lose money. Past performance is never a guarantee of future results. Tax strategy services are provided by American Tax Strategies, LLC. Investment advisory services are provided by Wealthcare Asset Management, LLC. Thank you for listening to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of SavingYouTaxes.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your own qualified advisor with any questions you may have regarding taxes and investing. 